He drew a deep breath to steady his nerves. As he slipped past Sharona into the chamber, he rested his hand on her shoulder for a moment. She shot him a puzzled smile, even as gleaming bolts of magical energy shot from her fingertips to plunge into the six-armed monster that was lumbering towards her. The cultists and monsters were in confused disarray, especially the ones who were still caught in the transformation from one to the other. Brendis intercepted the hulking thing, ensuring that it kept its distance from Sharona, while Miri charged around to the left and attacked a creature with human legs, plated in armor, and the four quarters of a panther-like monster, sleek and predatory. Monsters as adversaries are an important part of playing Dungeons and Dragons. So much so that in every edition, the monster manuals are a full third of the core books required to play the game. So in this Library of Kornberg, we're opening a new book on the monster manual itself. For each of the monsters that appear, we're going to look at how they fit into the world of Eberron, starting from A and going to Z. As the first instance of what is going to be an ongoing series, I want to give you a quick overview of the structure of these episodes. In each instance of the series, we're going to look at each monster in the Monster Manual in sequence as they appear in the 5th edition version of that book. And one to three monsters will be featured depending on how much information is available in the Eberron canon about each of them. For each of those creatures that we look at, before looking at them in the context of Eberron, we'll cover how that monster acts and looks in the core worlds like the Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, etc. As that's generally what their monster manual entries are based on. I want to make sure that you know the baseline that we're starting from before we look how Eberron changes the creature in its own unique way. Then, before we get to Eberron's specifics, I'll give you a quick overview of the history of publication of the monster. So where they originated if it wasn't the original D&D box set, and where they've appeared in each edition since. Then we get to what the monster is like in Eberron itself, especially focusing on how they differ in appearance or personality from the D&D Cold Worlds. You know, how they fit into Eberron's history and relations with other creatures. And if there's a case that there's a very important related monster, especially one that doesn't appear in the monster manual, so it won't get its own episode, I'll give them a little bit of coverage as well. I'll also look at which regions of the world they can be found within, and any named NPCs that exist for that type of creature, if there are any and any appearances that they might have in official Eberron adventures. Then I'll cover all of the canon sources for information about the monster, so you can read those details yourself. As in most cases, I cannot cover absolutely everything. If there is official material that contradicts itself or has been retconned in Eberron sources, I will cover that in this section as well. Okay, so let's get along to the first entry in the manual. The first entry in the 5th edition monster manual is the Aracocra, which is a winged humanoid native to the elemental plane of air, at least in the core worlds of D&D. Very little has been detailed on this monster as to its role in Eberron, but as it was made playable as a player character race in 5th edition with a few books, I want to actually cover them closer in the Outside of the Core races series instead of in this one. Nevertheless, I'll give you a bit of information here. Aarakocra go back as adversaries in D&D before the rise of the Eberron setting, first appearing in the major AD&D 1st edition monster book, 
the Fiend Folio. Then it made it to the core monstrous manual for 2nd edition AD&D, but got demoted to appear only in Forgotten Realms specific books in 3rd edition, specifically the Monsters of Arun Monster Compendium. The Bird Folk never got featured in 4th, but came back into the core for 5th edition. Their look and body structure was greatly changed in that interim, going from two wings and two legs to a pair each of arms, legs, and wings. So where do Aarakocra appear in Eberron material? Okay, so they don't directly appear in any of hardcovers, adventures, or anything, nor are they mentioned in anything either. However, in 3.5, Aarakocra had a very similar counterpart introduced in a book called Races of the Wild, the Raptorans. They are bird humanoids, much like the Aarakocra, and did have a flying ability. This race disappeared from official support since, so because they actually fill in the same niche, it is easy enough to use the information about them regarding Aarakocra instead. And they are actually physically closer to modern Aarakocra than the, the ones that appeared in that period. You can find the barest mention of the Reptorans in the 3.5 Player's Guide to Eberron. And a single encounter described with some Raptorans in Secrets of Zendrik. Their biggest appearance was the semi canonical adventures from the official RPGA Zendrik Expeditions campaign, as it does have a significant role for Raptorans for one of the featured factions, the Covenant of Light, over the course of their campaign. Starting in their fourth adventure, CVN 4, Brave Soldiers, and pretty much going through the rest of that adventure path. At least one Raptoran appears. I'll explain about these obscure RPGA adventures more later in the video, but that is it. A placement in Zendrik and some obscure adventure appearances. Aboliths are aberrations that dwell in the waves. They are ancient things of malevolence who use strong psychic abilities to tempt, coerce, or enslave their enemies towards their nefarious causes. Let's start by looking at their depictions in the core worlds of D&D like the Forgotten Realms and Greyhawk. Avalis are an aquatic creature who look like an eel and squid and a whale mixed together, bearing many tentacles, fins, and a huge mouth, and are often depicted with multiple eyes. They have large mucus excreting membranes that ooze their magical sludge, used to transform thralls, and also used to create a slime trail to make short overland movement slightly easier. The creatures are quite intelligent and have perfect recall, even passing all of their memories along to their progeny. That means they remember everything that has happened in the past clearly and easily. As one of the earliest creatures to become intelligent, they attempted to take full control of the world's oceans and act like gods. But then, the true deities of the world made their presence known and toppled their underwater cities. The exact details of this era have changed somewhat from edition to edition, with their origin being tied to the Far Realm in some cases, but they are always figures of ancient evil in the tradition of noted horror writer and xenophobe H.P. Lovecraft. Either way, Aboleths still hold a grudge against the gods to this day, and wish to return to the time when the Abolithic supremacy reigns again. Aboleths first appeared in D&D in 1981's first edition AD&D adventure, Dwellers of the Forbidden City, where a local tribe of humanoids worships it as a god. They made it into the second monster manual of first edition, released in 1983, and subsequently have made it into the primary monster manual of every edition subsequent. In 
and are now one of the most identifiable enemies of D&D in general. A creature connected to Atlas in profound ways in the core worlds of D&D are their mutated servants, which are most often times called scum. They are the result of long-term exposure to Atlas magical mucus and psionic mind influence. Their exact method of creation and exact form have changed greatly over editions. They first appeared for second edition AD&D in Polyhedron Magazine number 67, and then got reprinted in the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, though not illustrated, and appeared again in the Monstrous Compendium Annual 1 with a new illustration. For a third edition, they made it into the Monster Manual in a brand new visual form. And again, in fourth edition, they were in the Monster Manual, but under the name of Abolesque Servitors, with the name Scum reassigned to an ooze that represents a transformation gone wrong in the Monster Manual 2. They're back to the name Scum in fifth edition, but didn't appear until their role in the adventure Ghosts of Saltmarsh, which also significantly features Abolus. The Aboliths, as they appear in Eberron, don't differ greatly from the core worlds of D&D in look or general theme. They are still ancient creatures with alien minds that live in the depths of the world's bodies of water. The story of the ancient struggle between them and the gods is dropped, as the gods of Eberron are not a physical force in the world. Instead, you see their ancient struggle inserted into the, one of the ancient conflicts in the history of Eberron. The Avalis are much like the Lords of Dust in both personality and origin. They emerged from the depths of Kyber in the Age of Demons. In fact, like the Rakashas of the Lords of Dust, Avalis were created by one of the fiendish overlords. Specifically, the overlord, known as the Lurker in Shadow, created the Avalithic Menace. Like the other fiends spawned from Kyber on dry land, the Avalis fought beneath the sea against the ancient dragons and coattles, resulting in their loss in the war and the binding of the overlords. The Lurker in Shadow is bound deep within Kyber, beneath the center of the Thunder Sea. That defeat is the great loss that looms large in the persistent mind of the Aboleth instead of the defeat by the gods. They are trying to recapture their ancient civilizations from the Age of Demons, when they had hordes of undersea servants of many races. Now they may ally with landlocked lords of dust for their endeavors, as their antediluvian undersea cities exist not just at the bottom of the ocean, but also in undersea tunnels and underground seas beneath the continental portions of Aberon as well and prophecy or other interests of the Aboleth may overlap with the feline fiends. These underground seas of the Aboleths are usually called sunless seas. No matter the location, the ruins hold primordial treasures and unique artifacts from the Age of Demons that Aboleths use to lure prospective allies, thralls, or bribe potential enemies. Aboleths can potentially be found in any large body of water in Eberron, but canonically there are three main regions we know they operate within. Since the end of the Age of Demons, Aboleths cannot easily and openly swim in many oceans due to their enemies. Despite their individual power, Aboleth numbers are relatively low compared to their multitudes of enemies, so they stick to those dark depths of the sea to avoid detection from prying eyes. This is especially true in their main haunt, the Thunder Sea, in and around Shargon's Teeth. There are a few attested Aboleth ruins and cities beneath the sea, nearest to the bound lurker and shadow overlord that many Aboleths serve. We know that the sea floor is cracked and broken, and there are many tunnels that Aboleths live and build within, 
making staying hidden relatively easy. Another specific location we know that obelisks are active in is the Dragon Reach Sea, especially around the maelstrom called the Dragon's Mistress, where obelisks sometimes openly move against their ancient enemies, the dragons. Finally, in any sunless sea in the depths of Kyber itself, even under continental regions, obelisks may dwell in the darkness at the roots of the world. As an ancient evil, Abolith schemes run deep, especially among undersea creatures. In ancient times, most of the Abolith's thralls were created primarily from the Sahuagin and Storm Giants found in and around the Thunder Sea. Upon the binding of the Lurker in Shadow, the Abolith pulled back to the deepest recesses of the sea, allowing the rise of the Sahuagin empires in the Thunder Sea, and of course the giant civilization in Zendrik. Since that time, the Sahuagin civilizations have risen and fallen, but they have had Abolis as an ever-present threat. They have engaged in open war with the Abolis at various points in history, and war against other Sahuagin clans as directed by Abolis. To this day, the Sea Devils are split between clans affected by influence from Abolis and clans highly opposed to the Abolis, and wish to eat them to absorb their power. It's actually said that the Chul was engineered by Abolis to attack Sahuagin communities, and so additional discord, keeping them off balance and unable to rise to their full power and oppose the Abolis. As for their mind control thralls and servitors mutated into scum, most of them are originally aquatic humanoids like Sahuagin and Kuatoa, basically any creature that regularly serves as a general servitor to the Abolus. But humans and other coastal living humanoids are often drawn into cults of the dragon below, dedicated to worshipping Abolus, and then their elected may become scum. We know that agents of Abolus are active in cities on either side of the Thunder Sea, namely Sharn and Stormreach, especially. There is only one named Abolith NPC that appears in any official Eberron material, which is within the only series of adventures that have Abolith at all in Eberron. That is the first three adventures in the Cabal of Shadows faction line within the Zendrik Expedition series of our PGA adventures. As these adventures are quite obscure, and both monsters in this episode reference these RPGA adventures, let me explain them. As part of previous organized play programs, Wizards of the Coast and their RPGA, or Role Playing Game Association, would run themed campaigns with a large number of adventures to be played in store or at gaming conventions. There were a number of these in the 3.5 era, like Living Greyhawk and the Legacy of the Green Regent, based in Greyhawk and the Forgotten Realms, respectively. Eberron had two of these campaigns, Mark of Heroes and Zendrick Expeditions. Expeditions ran from 2006 to 2008, and the adventures were based out of Stormreach. Player characters would all be members of specific factions created for the series, though they would also all be mentioned in the book City of Stormreach a little as well. The factions were the Black Wheel Company, the Crimson Codex, the Cabal of Shadows, and the Covenant of Light. All adventures, but a few special ones created for the expedition campaigns, could only be played by characters from their own faction. Adventures were distributed as PDFs that could be downloaded from the Wizard of the Coast website by registered RPGA DMs, though one per faction were also printed to be given out as part of organized play kits for retail stores. Anyway, the storyline for the Cabal of Shadows faction focused for the first three adventures on growing Lovecraftian horror in Stormreach which is why the second adventure's title is a nod to the Lovecraft novella, The Shadows Over Innsmouth, 
and was called Shadows Over Stormreach. The first adventure was the Sahuagin Stone, and the third adventure was Kyber's Children. The general plot of the adventures has the party opposing attacks on Stormreach by scum thralls of Abolus, and then by the third adventure, they're delving deep into the Thunder Sea to enter the Abolus Lair and steal a psychically active artifact. There's not actually a lot of details about the Abolus themselves within the adventure, just that the one that you're delving into their lair has a reputation as the master of an entire Abolus city beneath the Thunder Sea and is known as Volgothoth, the Catcher in the Deep. Sadly, these adventures are not illustrated to see if Scum or Abolus might get a unique visual interpretation in Eberron. I also want to note, at some point, I will be covering all of these RPGA adventures in uh, episodes specifically about them each. So in this section, I want to go over each of the primary sources for information that exist about Abolus and Eberron in approximately the order of their publication. I will also quickly animate the cover of the book, filling up with color to illustrate how much information is actually included in that book. Eberron campaign setting. There's basically nothing here except using an Aboleth as example of the type of a monster ability affected by a specific feat. Sharn, City of Towers. There's only a brief mention of Abolus as an example of a mastermind type enemy that uses minions to operate within Sharn. Player's Guide to Eberron. The first significant mention of Abolith lore is here. It still amounts to only things like an example in a feat again, but there is information that could be provided to a player based on knowledge checks about them specifically as well, though it's pretty clear that the designers had not yet fully figured out yet if Abolus are Spawn of Kyber or Creations of the Dalkir. Though, as it is presented as in-world lore, it being unclear is actually absolutely fine. Zendric Expedition Adventures. Like I talked about earlier, the Abolith and Scum play a central role in these first three adventures from the Cabal of Shadows adventure path. Despite this, little is actually added to the lore of Abolith in Eberron. Secrets of Zendric. This book is where the Thundersea and Sahuagin were directly tied into Abolith, and the suggestion that Abolith being effectively the Rakshasas of the Seas was first made. It still only amounts to a couple of paragraphs, though. Faiths of Eberron. A very short entry, just using Abolith as an example of psychic aberrations that form Cults of the Dragon below. Dragons of Eberron. This book is where the first explicit connection to Abolus and fiendish overlords is made. It has uses of Abolus and encounter tables and information about Abolith activity in the Dragon Reach Sea. City of Stormreach. This source has only a few suggestions on how Abolus in the Thunder Sea have agents operating within and influencing things in Stormreach. In some ways, it just codifies the semi-canonical information that appears in the previous expedition adventures. Eberron Campaign Guide. While there are a few paragraphs about Abolus here, plus a suggested encounter in the sewers of Sharn involving an Aboleth, there are some major issues in this appearance too. Now, this is where the Sunless Seas are established, and also that Abolus may appear in the depths of Kyber. However, Abolus are called creations of Zoriat specifically. This is, of course, not something that any other source, except for the 3.5 Player's Guide, concurs with. Eberron, Rising from the Last War. 5th edition setting guide, unfortunately, has nothing at all about Abolus. 
exploring Eberron. Pretty much the rest of the material in this video was based on what comes from this source. This is where the Lurker and Shadow was established, the ties to Chul, and the ties with Sahuagin explored the most. This is actually the biggest and best overall source for information on the Undersea Aberration. Okay, so one last thing I want to cover before we wrap this all up. So how do you use Aarakocra and Abolus in your Eberron campaign? Well, for our bird people, I'd recommend using them sparingly. Only use them if you're operating in Zendrik, or maybe the Plain Sirenia, and specifically need something in your plot that needs flying humanoids for the plot to actually make sense. For Abolus, they can pretty much be used exactly like they are in the core worlds of D&D. They are big alien creatures of the deep. They can slot into any place anytime you need some sort of mastermind plotter behind everything. Obviously, if you're focused on a campaign around and or under the Thunder Sea, there can be even more uses for them due to their connections to the Sahuagin communities and their ability to plot against any of the other undersea civilizations. Being allied to the Lords of Dust adds additional options. If your campaign is land-based normally, and the big bad of your campaign is a Lord of Dust, perhaps they could call in a favor from one of their Aboleth allies as the party has to cross the sea. Something like that. And you can always use them as the creepy mind behind an inhuman Cult of the Dragon Below. Okay, so that's the first two entries in the Monster Manual covered. So for now, let's close the book and exit the Library of Kornberg. So thanks very much for watching and learning here on the Eberron Archaeologist. Next time is going to be another Library of Kornberg instead of the normal rotation to an Eberron collector that I'd normally have in that slot, because I felt like doing the next entry in the Core Races series here as well. Which race will be covered? You'll need to stay tuned to find out. Get subscribed so you don't miss it. Don't forget that Eberron Archaeologist is on Instagram and Twitter. I have a feature on Instagram where I show off an Eberron mini every week, usually ones I haven't featured in a video yet. And both accounts post channel news, and whenever a new video goes live. Links to both are in the video description.